Hey, sports fans. If you're into fantasy sports, I want to turn you on to the Fantasy Sports Network, the world's first and only 24-hour channel dedicated to fantasy sports. They've got great content across tons of sports, so head over there and check them out. You might even see me appear there offering NBA insights. I'm in. If you looked at LeBron's numbers through the first four games of the 2016 NBA Finals without knowing the results of the games, it would be easy to think the Cavaliers were sitting pretty. However, that was far from the case as the Cavs were on the brink of losing another Finals and extending their streak of no championships in Cleveland to 53 years. Since no team had ever come back from a 3-1 deficit in the Finals, it would take something historical and truly epic to get them to the promised land. And that is exactly what LeBron James did. In leading his team to three straight victories, with two of them on the road, he accomplished something no one had ever done. First off, no one has ever averaged numbers like this for a final series. And when you look at his last three games, there's simply no one else that can come even close. As we discussed in our earlier LeBron offense in the finals breakdown, we separated his half-court attack into three main categories. Post-up, isolation, and pick and roll. After Game 1's whopping 13 post-ups, the Cavs readjusted their attack and severely reduced the amount he went down low to the block. And in the last three games, it was by far his least effective category. The Warriors were able to effectively contain his teammates as they stood stagnant on the weak side and help on LeBron to force him into misses or bad turnovers down low. That said, Game 7 was his most efficient production from post-ups from the last three games, and as we saw how close it ended up being, every precious point was desperately needed. Iguodala defended LeBron the most on his post-ups, and he had the strength to keep LeBron from easily getting to the rim, and his ultra-quick hands knocked away quite a few balls, leading to steals down low. Steph Curry got caught defending quite a few post-ups as well off of switches, and LeBron was able to back him down to the rim when there was no help to be found. And again in Game 6, while Curry did his best, he was no match for a player so much bigger than him, and a simple drop step gets the job done. And when the help did come to support Curry down low, LeBron was able to generate points by skipping the ball and seeing his teammates find the open shots on the perimeter. And LeBron's patience and floor vision was unparalleled as he finds JR off a little flare screen to get another open look after commanding all the focus down low. As a coach, I will always prefer a system of movement and team-oriented offensive attack versus isolations, but it is a testament to LeBron's greatness that he was able to not only significantly increase his one-on-one -on -one possessions, but maintain a consistently good efficiency rating on them. Simply put, the Warriors could not come up with a game plan to stop him from imposing his will on the game, directing traffic and tempo, seeking out the proper mismatches without all that fancy smancy player and ball movement, then putting on his hard hat and going to work. Of course, with Iguodala guarding LeBron so often, it's no surprise he defended him on the most isolation possessions. LeBron was able to generate .89 points per possession, and on this play, the Cavs run horns to get LeBron an elbow touch, a difficult spot for the defense only one dribble away from the hoop. The offense stagnates quickly, leaving LeBron to attack Iguodala, and when he gets that deep into the lane, there's nothing you can do. Many of the Cavs' possessions resulted in an iso from Kyrie, and if he couldn't get anything, let LeBron have a turn. While the spacing was sort of there for him, he had to go old school with this nice sweeping right hook off the glass. And here's another example of the Cavaliers struggling a little to get their offense going quickly. So, LeBron streamlines the whole thing by seeking out the player he wants to pick on, in this case Livingston, and isolating on him. Even though LeBron doesn't score, he collapses the defense and draws everyone's attention, which allowed Tristan Thompson to feast on offensive rebounds and putbacks all series long. 
When Curry guarded him, it was a testament to the team defense, as you can see LeBron has two shadows in Barnes and Draymond. With poor spacing on the weak side, it allowed the Warriors to bottle up this JR three-point attempt. On this possession, the Warriors screw up their transition defense, leaving Steph on an island to deal with the LeBron freight train. LeBron tries to bully his way through, but Steph comes up with the strip. That said, LeBron was able to get some scores when Curry was on him in isolation. Here's a good example of LeBron forcing the switch with a pick and roll, and Curry doing all he can do to swipe, but gets his hand in the cookie jar, giving up two free throws. LeBron also attacked Klay Thompson often out of the isolation, and Klay was able to keep him in check. But on this play, more LeBron orchestration to force the switch out of the pick and roll, and again, it's almost impossible to stop LeBron from scoring when he's got the ball in a triple threat stance 15 feet from the hoop. With Draymond Green out of the lineup for Game 5, it freed up the offense to attack more from the perimeter, without Green's presence to roam on the weak side and get in the way, as he'd done so successfully in Games 1-4. through four. This opened up the pick and roll attack for the Cavs, who did it 17 times in Game 5, and then continued that trend in Game 6 and 7. Game 6 was the most successful pick and roll game of the series for LeBron, as they were able to effectively attack Iguodala with Izili guarding the roll man a couple of times, as Izili tries to ice this and Iguodala allows middle. And on this play, Iguodala simply cannot double LeBron in this position, leaving Thompson open with nothing Harrison Barnes can do to get there in time. Here, there was no need to switch this. Iguodala had room to get through, but the Cavs get Curry on LeBron, triggering the Draymond Green shadow down low. However, the defensive three-second rule forces Green to step out of the lane or get within an arm's length of Thompson. It's pretty easy to see what he should have done on this one. You can see the kind of gravity LeBron exerts on his pick and rolls, as Livingston gets completely absorbed in his tractor beam, allowing a simple pass to Kyrie, who exploits Livingston's poor position to get into the lane for a gorgeous finish. On this pick and roll, the Cavs again exploit the elbow, this time with a ball screen with Curry's man. Curry is completely out of position, Iguodala gets screened, and Bogut is way too slow rotating. More great LeBron output from the pick and roll, displaying lots of patience to keep screening with Thompson so he can catch Iguodala out of position, allowing middle, where LeBron can knife to the basket unimpeded. More examples of the Cavaliers offense screening, then rescreening, then rescreening again until LeBron conjures his own magic over the much smaller Barbosa. While the pick and roll wasn't nearly as effective for LeBron in Game 7, they got two crucial scores out of it in the second half. Down by their biggest margin of the game, they tried to get Curry switched onto LeBron, which worked, but it freed up J.R. Smith to pick and pop for a three, with just enough daylight when Draymond took an extra step towards James before closing out. And we all remember this crucial three-pointer by LeBron when they were able to force the Izili switch onto him, and LeBron, having shot three straight free throws to possession before, nails this three to give his team the lead. Which brings me to the last piece of the puzzle, three-point shooting. The first four games of the series, LeBron was suffering through a 31% output on four three-point attempts per game. Yet, overnight, he caught fire and finished the last three games of the series, nailing 42% of his threes and taking over six of them a game. It wasn't easy to pinpoint exactly what the difference was, and if you examine the shot charts, you can see that he could not hit a three from the left wing in the first four games, but feasted on them from that spot in the final three. In the first four games, it felt like the arc wasn't as high coming out of his hand, creating a flatter shot that was prone to missing. Compare that to the last three games, where the arc on his shot improved markedly, as the ball was rising over the level of the backboard on these shots, increasing the size of the rim as it finished its parabola down through the hoop. In the end, has enough been said about LeBron's performance in the finals? Maybe, maybe not, but without question it will go down as one of the toughest, most productive, and even jaw-dropping performances we have ever seen in an NBA Finals. 
and it took every single ounce of his energy to snatch the finals trophy away from the Warriors and set up what will potentially be the best rivalry the NBA has ever seen.